نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي بذيرا من اخلي اللهم فكنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين سمعني السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله in our weekly sessions today we are going to start surah al baqara i welcome all of you we shall be inshallah trying to cover at least one chapter in each session uh, allah subhanahu wa taala accept all the classes and all the sessions and help us uh, connect with the teachings of surah al baqara and help us understand and help us spread the words of surah al baqara also Surah Al-Baqarah it is a madani surah and it is the longest surah of Quran it has 40 chapters and 286 verses and it is the second by the order of arrangement and 86th by the order of revelation and it was revealed in the initial years of uh, the madani period almost immediately after prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam emigrated from mecca and he uh, came over to medina and a new islamic state came into being it was then that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah baqara gave his commandments his rules his regulations his laws and do's and don'ts which were needed for the proper guidance of the muslims of this islamic state now as far as the names of surah baqara is concerned the first name surah baqara has the reason that in arabic baqara means the cow and in a chapter of surah baqara allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the incidents of the cow in the people of bani israel so that is the reference to the name of surah al baqara and then there are other names which prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has um, explained about surah al baqara uh, narrating the excellence of surah al baqara itself for example prophet sallallahu has uh, said that it is sanam al quran sanam means the peak the peak or the hump that is the highest point of something prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been reported to inform about surah baqara in tarimdi that he said that everything has a hump you know the hump is the highest part in the back of the camel so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that everything has a hump or a high peak and the hump of quran is surah al baqara and if anyone resides it in his house during the night no devil will enter it for three nights and if anyone resides it in, in his house during the day no devil will enter it for three days imagine imagine the extent of protection we are going to achieve after the recitation of surah al baqarah subhanallah so and then there is another uh, name which prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has called surah baqarah with is az zahra wayn the two brightly shining lights it is reported in the rimdi that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said az zahra wayn two brightly shining lights and these refer to what surah al baqarah and surah al imran and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed that recite them two brightly shining lights recite them because they will come as for intercession on the day of judgment and they will argue they will argue for the people who are connected to them and they their intercession will be accorded 
And then in other words, Prophet said that they will come in the form of two shady clouds, or they will also come, or they will come as if they're shadows of lines of birds, and they will argue on behalf of their people. Their people are going to be who? Who read them, who recite them, who try to learn the commandments and the teachings, and who believe in the teachings and the messages, and who act upon the teachings of the commandments of Surah Bakra. So Surah Bakra will what? They will argue on behalf of their people. So according to uh, these verses of these words of the Prophet Sallallahu thus it has um, three names. It has been called as Al-Ghamamatani, Al-Aswadani. This means what? Two black clouds. Al Oyayatani or Az Zillatani. This also refers to the two shelters and Al Khirtani Minatai, two flocks of birds. And then it has been by a certain people, scholars, it is also called as Surah Al Ummatain. The Surah of uh, two Ummas or two uh, followers of the uh, of uh, the prophets. Why is it called Surah Al Ummatan is or Ummatain is because in this Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has explained the conditions, the behaviors, and the attitudes of the people of the book that is the Jews and the Christians. And uh, why has Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala explained the behaviors and the attitudes of Jews and Christians is because of two main reasons. Because you know, when the Prophet Sallallahu was in Mecca, the Muslims were exposed to, and they were dealing with the Meccans, the idolaters. And there, in all the Makki surahs, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has explained about uh, concepts of faith and belief and negation of polytheism and the importance of monotheism and the importance of the correct faith and the fundamentals of belief. But when Muslims, they migrated to Medina, then here they were basically dealing with the people of the book, especially the Jews. And uh, so in uh, the surah Al-Baqarah, which was read immediately after the migration of Prophet Sallallahu Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala explained the behavior of the Jews and their ill behaviors and their ill manners so that Muslims need to understand them and refrain from these behaviors. And the second uh, reason why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has explained the behavior of the Jews and the Christians in Surah Baqarah is when we relate it with Surah Fatiha. Because you know what? In Surah Al-Fatiha, the reciter, after glorifying and after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making a promise and covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reciter asked for what? For guidance. And the reciter precisely explained that he did not want to be guided towards the path of al maghdub and al dwalin that is the Jews and the Christians. So here in this a surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has precisely explained the conditions and the behaviors of the people of the book, the maghdub and the dwalim, so that the Muslims uh, come to know and understand the exact mannerism, and it becomes very really easy for the Muslims to refrain from those behaviors and attitudes. So that is why it is also known as surah al-ummatan. And then regarding the excellence of um, Surah Al-Baqarah, there are a few words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like uh, in Tirmidhi, if it's related, has that uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and he narrates that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he instructed, do not turn your houses into graves. Do not turn your houses into graves. Indeed, the shaitan, the devil, does not enter the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. So if we want ourselves and our children and our families to be protected from the effects and from all the activities of shaitan, we need to connect and stay connected with Surah Al-Baqarah. Similarly, uh, Prophet has explained that 
to acquire Surah Baqarah is what? It is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be deprived or to stay away from Surah Al-Baqarah is depriving yourselves from what? From the blessings and bounties and barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Surah Al-Baqarah is a protection from uh, black magic and all um, such harmful things as it is reported in uh, Hadith of Ibn Majah that uh, Prophet ﷺ has been reported to inform about 53 verses to exorcise from the devils and the jinns. And among these 53 verses, 10 are from Surah Al-Baqarah. These 10 verses from Surah Baqarah out of those 53 verses which are used to exorcise are the first four verses of Surah Baqarah and then the Ayat Al-Kursi, with the two verses following it, that is the verse 256 and 257, and the last three verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And this is with reference from uh, Ibn Majah, and uh, the, um, the number of the hadith is 3549. So this is the importance of Surah Al-Baqarah, that it is it helps against all form of uh, black magic or the effects of jinn or sorcery or evil eye or all forms of protection. Similarly, um, as far as the excellence of the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah is concerned, Hazrat Abu Masood radiallahu ta'ala and who reports in Ibn Majah the Prophet said that whoever recites the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah at night, it will be sufficient for him. It will be sufficient for him. And uh, this hadith has been explained in Tafsir ibn Qafi. And uh, it has been explained to say that whoever recites these last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah before he goes up to sleep, then this will bring as much mercy from Allah as would the prayer of the Hajjul. If the person had performed the uh, prayer of the Hajjul, then as much mercy and reward the person would have gained, he will if he recites these two last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And similarly, these uh, last two verses were the gift of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, which were given to the Prophet Sallallahu at the night of the session. That is the Shabe Miraj. It is reported in uh, Nasai that uh, Prophet Sallallahu said that I was given with four, uh, with five gifts were bestowed upon me on the night of the journey. And out of these five gifts are the five prayers of the five Salah, five times a day. And uh, other is the Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Al-Baqarah. And let's revise. Uh, what uh, the hadith which I also uh, narrated uh, regarding Surah Al-Fatiha, that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that uh, Hazrat Jibra'il was sitting with him and then he looked up at the sky and he said that, did you hear what I heard? And uh, he said that today a door of heaven has opened, which was never opened previously. And a group of angels has descended, which never uh, descended previously and then Prophet Salaam today will be given as two bright lights which no Prophet was given previously and these two bright lights and two special gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were what? The Surah Al-Fatiha, the seven verses of Surah Al-Fatiha and what else? The last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And then Prophet Sallallahu introducing those two, he said that if somebody will recite these two before making a supplication, then his supplication will be heard. And a person who will be reciting these two, then his uh, he will not be deprived of the blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So this is the merit and this is the excellence of the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And then Prophet Sallallahu has also said that in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, there is a surah, which uh, there, is, um, there is a verse, which is the master and the leader of the verses of Quran. And that is what? That is Ayat Al-Qursi. So now with this uh, basic introduction, let's start, Alhamdulillah, with the chapter one. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. These are the muqattiyats. 
and the root word for this is qaf ta ain and qata means to cut off to split or to separate so these are the words which have been placed before certain surahs not all but certain surahs of quran but these are words which the letters of which words although they seem to have been joined while writing they seem to have been joined but they do not join each other to form a word with a literal meaning they appear to be joined but they are not actually joined to form a word with a literal meaning the letters of the words are actually cut off from each other they are separated from each other and they are actually what they are split off now what uh, is the importance of these words and what do these words signify there have been different uh, they do not have any meaning and they are in many commentaries different things have been different concepts have been related with these words like there are some who say that these are these words are uh, for certain abbreviations like people say that alif means allah and uh, mim is for muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam no there is no such a thing mentioned in quran or hadith then you come across certain people commenting in certain commentaries explaining that these words since they are recited uh, in a rhythmical note alif lam mim so they are recited in a rhythmical note prolonging the certain letter and shortening the certain letter so they say that this is because they have been placed at the start of few chapters of quran that in the start of that chapter or in the start of few surahs of quran because um, if it would start with the recitation if the surah of quran will start with the recitation of these rhythmical words then they will attract the attention of all those around who are listening to the recitation because of the rhythmical initiating note but you see that nothing of the sort has been explained or uh, spoken about by the words of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam all what prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told us about the importance of these words in uh, a hadith is that he said that they are separate words and for the recitation of each letter there will be a reward of 10 good deeds so what actually we how we need to relate with these is that none of us needs to go about investigating about what these words mean and what they are for all what we need to relate and connect with them is to recite the words in the correct manner in the correct pronunciation with the correct maharaj and with the correct uh, elongating the words and with the correct rules and regulations of the recitation of quran in a correct manner so that we can get the best reward out of the recitation of these words verse number 2 that word becomes a proper noun it becomes a proper noun and al means all or al means the so al kitab means what that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it is not any book in arabic for any book it would have been said kitabun kitaban but no it is al kitab it is the book and which the book the best book the only book of its type so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is handing over the reciter and the believer a book and is saying look the book which i am giving you is the best book and it is the only book of its type and we in our previous uh, few sessions of uh, short clips i have been 
<coughs> narrating the words of Prophet Sallallahu regarding the excellence of Quran and the virtues of the teachings of Quran. And uh, Quran itself has said about itself, Wahua Khairun that Quran is what? It is the best thing which anybody can gather. And Prophet Sallallahu has been reported to say what? Khairun Man wa Allamahu. The best of you is he who reads the Quran himself and teaches it to others. Allahumma ja'alna minhum Allah, make us one of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is the best book. And then Prophet Sallallahu has also said that the superiority of Allah's book on the book of the bondsman is the same as the superiority of Allah, the creator over his bondsman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand the excellence of Quran and help us be steadfast in our connection and in our study of Quran. So now if we relate this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us what? The book. Now relating it to Surah Al-Fatiha. If I come back to talk about it in Surah Al-Fatiha, which is Surah Ad-Dua, the reciter with full respect glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asked for guidance towards Jannah, the straight path. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how, how Allah heard, accepted and answered the dua? There the person asked, the reciter asked, al-mustaqim, guide me to the straight path, guide me to the road to Jannah. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who heard, accepted and answered the dua, he says, O seeker of guidance, O, o reciter of Quran, you are desirous to the path of Jannah, take this, take this book. This will be hudan. This will be a guidance for you, the guidance you've asked for. So let's just stop here and see what messages we can derive from this. Number one, Surah Fatiha, no doubt, is Surah Dua. Supplication after it will be heard, it will be accepted, and it will be answered, isn't it? The reciter said, Ethana Surah al Mustaqim, and Allah says, Valikal Kitabu, take this book, it will be for that. So, number one point marked and highlighted Surah Fatiha, no doubt, is Surah at Dua. And supplication made after Surah Dua will be heard, accepted, answered. The second point that when we make Dua after glorifying, and after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make dua and supplication in a proper manner, then the dua reaches the throne of Allah like this one did. And then this whole, this whole obviously, it verifies the word of Prophet Sallallahu which I recited the hadith I narrated in the end of Surah Al-Fatiha. Hazrat Abu Huraira narrates in Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that I have divided the Salah between me and my bondsmen equally. When the person says, Alhamdulillah, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, my, my, my person, my bondsman has done what? He has, he has praised me. And then the person says, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawmiddin. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, my bondsman has done what? He has glorified me. And then the person says, And Allah says, this is between mutual between me and my bondsman. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala announces, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala announces, and now my, my person, when he asks for something, he shall be granted. So now, do we believe in this? We believe in this, that it is no doubt a surah which leads to the acceptance of all forms of supplications. Here we can we can clearly understand, we can clearly understand that the person who made dua, that dua was accepted and it was answered and it was accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we can also relate that surah Fatiha is a dua. And the whole of the Quran is the answer to the supplication or dua of Surah Fatiha. I repeat again, Surah Fatiha is a dua. It is a supplication of the reciter of the Quran at the start of Quran. 
And the whole of the Quran is the answer, is the acceptance to the dua. How beautiful is the relation between Surah Fatiha and the Quran. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, while handing us over the Quran, Allah says what? La ba fi. This is a book in which, how do you need to relate to it? La, don't, raiba, have any doubts in it. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after handing over the recital to the book, the book to the student of Quran who is desirous of guidance to the straight path has highlighted a don't. Allah says that all of you who want to learn the path to Jannah, take this book for guidance. It will be no doubt a hudan. It will be a guidance. But caution. The first thing you need to, which we need to adopt while connecting with, connecting with Quran is to stop from what? from any forms of doubt. You do not have to do what? You do not have to have doubts in Quran. Don't be doubtful, confused, double-minded about its do's, its don'ts, its halal and haram, its commandments, its orders, is its laws and regulations, but be sure-headed, clear-minded, convinced about all what it teaches, what it tells, and what it guides. Now, to whom is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking la wa fi? That don't have doubts in Quran. To the people of Makkah, to the non-believers, to the idolaters, yes, because they did not believe and they were doubtful about the existence of Allah, about the Prophet or Prophet وسلم, about the truth of Quran, whether it was being revealed to the Prophet وسلم, and about the truth of Quran being a book of Allah. They, they had doubts, they were confused, they were not sure-headed about all that. And they did not, all forms of doubts and confusion and lack of faith and belief. But is the worst just addressing the people are the people of the Quraysh or the people of the Makkah or the people of the Prophet Sallallahu period? No. Quran is meant for all times. Quran is meant for all ages. So, la raiba fi. How does it relate with us? What form of doubt is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala asking us to rule out? We believe in Allah. We believe in his book. We believe in the Prophet Salaam's prophethood. We have faith and believe in all three. We do not have any doubt in the authority of any of three of them. So which doubt is it referring to us about? You know what? Shaitan, the Aduvu Mubin, our greatest enemy and the greatest enemy of all the believers, puts all forms of doubts and confusions in the minds and in the hearts of the learner and the student of Quran. And what are the doubts? You know, the doubt which Shaitan manages to instill and infuse in the minds and in the thoughts and in the hearts of the reciters and the students of the Quran is that look, you are, you are reading and you are learning the teachings of Quran. But if you start acting according to the complete teachings of Quran, then there's no doubt you will face some losses of this world and you will be deprived of certain gains and successes of this world. So this is the doubt we need to take out of our minds and our hearts. We have to take out all the doubts and worries and confusions and being double-minded because of weakness of faith and belief. And we need to be sure, we need to be 100% convinced and convicted and we need to remember that people who act, who act on the teachings of Quran are what? Ula'ika humul muflihun. The people 
who read the Quran, learn the Quran, believe the Quran, and act according to the teachings of the Quran, they will be the person, the people, or the group of people who are going to be successful. They are not going to, they're not going to be faced with <coughs> losses in the world. And they're not going to be deprived of the success of the world. They are the people who, whom Allah says, faza fawzan azima. The superlative success is for people who will act and who will obey the teachings of Quran. And in contrast, Quran says that people who disobey or they leave the teachings of Quran in their in their daily lives, they are what? They are the people at loss. And then Allah says, They are the people at the greatest loss. So it is this doubt. It is this confusion that we need to correct. This is something we just don't have to be double-minded about. We have to be sure-headed about it. We have to be clear-headed about it. That if we accept, believe, and act upon the teachings of Quran, this book will be a key to all successes here and hereafter. And this book is a key to save us from all the losses here and hereafter. And to be able to get guidance from Quran, and the knowledge of Quran, we need to take out all such doubts and confusions. Because you know that doubt is something, it is a frame of mind. It is something which, if it is prevailing in a relationship, then the relationship will not flourish. The bond will not strengthen. For example, you see, if a wife, if a wife gets suspicious, or gets doubtful about her husband's relationships, then the marital bond will become weak. If a daughter starts having doubts in her mind that the mother loves her sister more than her, then the bond of the mother and the daughter will not develop. So the relation and bond with Quran will only and only develop. It will flourish and it will strengthen if the doubts and confusions are taken out. Prophet has instructed us, save yourselves from confusions and doubts, for this is what destroyed the previous nations. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they, this book, don't have any doubts in it, and it will become what? It will become hudan. It will become a guidance it will become a source of guidance for you. If you take it up, if you connect and read the Quran without any doubts or confusions, you go on accepting and adopting all, all the only then you will get guidance from this book of Quran. And then Allah says after this, it will get to be our source of guidance for whom? Lil muttaqin. Lam li means for. Muttaqin. Muttaqin are those who are God fearing, who are people of piety, who have taqwa, who are pious people. So now, from this part of the verse, we get another prerequisite to have guidance from connection of Quran. That Allah says, that this is the best book. And it is no doubt a book of guidance, but this will not be a guidance for all, but it will be a guidance just for those who have piety, who are God-fearing, the pious people of Allah. So now this is the second prerequisite we need to adopt to get guidance from the Quran. We are all in this first session, in the starting session, we are connecting with Quran. So these two things we need to remember because we are all desirous of Hudan. We are all connecting with it because we learn, want to learn and we want to be on the path to Jannah. Then number one, we need to take out all forms of doubts and confusions. And secondly, we need to check whether we are God-fearing and we have fear of Allah or not. Because you know, 
piety, fear of Allah, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves for his bondsmen. Allah says, in Allah yuhibbul muttaqeen. There is absolutely no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are God-fearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Allah ma'al muttaqeen. Again, there is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets with those. He helps those. He, help, he supports those who are God-fearing. Well, aqibatul lil muttaqeen. The good results, the end, the best rewards is for whom? Who are God-fearing. And Jannah, Allah says what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jannah, he has prepared specially for those who are muttaqeen, who are pious, who are God-fearing. And Prophet ﷺ has informed us that the two drops which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the best, the first is the drop of blood of a martyr and the second are the drops of the tears flowing out from the eyes of a believer because of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And seven people, the seven lucky people who would be in the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection, one of them will be who? Who when he is all by himself, he remembers his sins and he cries due to the fear of Allah. And Prophet Sallallahu is also informed that the bondsmen, that the bondsmen who, who in their solitude, they fear Allah and they seek his forgiveness because of the fear of Allah, they will have easy accountability or they will have no accountability on the day of resurrection. And Hadith also tells us that when the hair and the skin of the bondsmen are erected due to the fear of Allah, then their sins are cleared off. Now, remember to recite a brief dua in the words of Prophet Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Oh Allah, bless my soul, your fear, and make me what? Make me a pious, make me a pious bondsman and make me a believer of piety. Because you know, the Prophet said that the face, when the face of a person is touched by the tears rolling down to the fear of Allah, the fire of hell has been, has been it has been stopped that the fire of the hell will not touch the face. Fear of what? Fear of the anger of Allah, his wrath, his punishment, his questions, his accountability, his interrogation. As Allah says in Surah Rahman, وَلِمَنْ خَوْفَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّةً For the person who, who fears standing before the Lord, there will be Jannah. So now, if I summarize, to get guidance from Quran, we need two, two things. A don't. Don't is not to be doubtful about the teachings and the messages of Quran. And the two is to be God-fearing. And then in the verse, next part, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is going to explain the traits, the characteristics, and the behaviors of those who are going to get guidance from the Quran and who are the God-fearing and the muttaqin. Allah says, Allah zina, Yu'minuna, those who believe. Yu'minuna bil ghaib. Without, without seeing, no, ghaib is anything. Ghaib refers to all the things which a person cannot feel or sense with his five senses. The five senses being what? Our sense of sight, back to vision our sense of smell, our sense of hearing, our sense of temperature, that is, it is hot, it is cold, its shape, it's, its pressure, its proprioception, and our sense of taste. So the God-fearing people, the pious or the people of piety, number one, are those who believe, and belief is, basically of five types. 
and belief is belief in Allah and belief in his angels, belief in his divine scriptures or the holy books, which the angels brought to the prophets and believe in the prophets and believe in the hereafter. So these are the five basic fundamentals of belief. So the first, the first thing which muttaqeen or the guided people do is that they believe. They believe without hearing, seeing, touching or tasting. And we cannot see or hear or touch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, or the angels. And we cannot directly see the day of judgment. And similarly, we might be seeing or looking at the Quran, but we cannot comprehend the revolutions of the Quran with our five senses. And similar is the case with the prophets. So the first thing which is needed is for the guidance from Quran is what? Yukminuna bil Iman. The first thing which is needed is Iman. Iman is what? Iman is belief. To have faith. And the root word of Iman is Hamza mean noon, Aman. Aman means peace. And Iman means to accept something. And remember that belief or Iman is very intricately related with peace. Because once, once people start believing and accepting, then there is peace. Because once the orders, they start getting accepted, then peace prevails. For example, if you see in the universe, all the, all the heavenly bodies and all the creations of the universe, they accept and they obey the orders of Allah. So there is total peace in the universe. In our lives, we see on a road, when all the traffic starts accepting and obeying the traffic laws, then there is what? There is peace. In a house, when the wife starts accepting the orders of her husband, there is peace. In a family, when the children start obeying and accepting the orders of the parents, there is peace. So the basic lesson learned here is that if we want to be peaceful, if we want ourselves to be peaceful, our homes, are the houses to be peaceful, we need to accept. We need to accept the orders of Allah, the Quran, and Prophet So now, moving ahead, what do we mean by Iman and what do we mean by belief? I repeat again, it means to obey, to accept. Obey how? Or to accept how? In our mind, to obey in hearts of hearts or to obey by the word of our mouth is accepting in our hearts in our minds and or by the actually verbal words of mouth is it sufficient and does that lead to a perfection of faith okay fine this is a part of belief and this is a part of iman but you know what Believing is actually acting upon all which we believe. Acting upon all we claim to believe by our words and in our hearts. Belief is not perfected and belief will not be completed until, unless we act upon what we claim to of which we announce to have believed. For example, if I I explain this by a few examples. You see, there's a mother and the mother asks the son to get up and offer his salah. And the son says, okay, mom, but he doesn't get up. The mother again reminds and he says, and the son again says, okay, mom, I'll soon get up. And I'll be, I'll, I'll soon offer my prayers, okay. For the third time, the mother again reminds him, the son says, oh, my dearest for me, oh, my loveliest for me, okay. But he still doesn't offer salah. Oh, there is a father. He, he, he talks to his daughter and he asks the daughter, that my dear daughter, when you, come, when, you, when you leave your house, please cover your head and wear your hijab. And she says, okay, dad. 
fine, I'll be doing that. But when she goes out of her house, she doesn't do that. The father next day again tells her, and she very politely says, and very obediently, she says, okay, fine, I'll do so. She again just doesn't cover her hair. The third time, third day, the father again tells her the same thing, and she says, oh, my dear, is Bob, I surely do what you say. But then again, she's not doing the same. What do you think the parents will say? Do you think the parents will say that the children obey us and the, and the children believe us? No, for sure no. So this is what belief and Iman is. That believing in hearts of hearts, announcing by the words of mouth, and then physically actually acting upon what we believe and what we say that we believe is actually perfection and completion of belief or faith. Now, to analyze the status of our belief and our faith, I will be now reciting a few verses and relating a few words of the Prophet for us to assess that where are we regarding the level of our faith and belief. The first prerequisite and the first and the primary importance for faith is, as Allah says, those who believe are the most intense in the love of Allah. That is the desire to please, the desire to obey, the desire to stop making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala displeased should be the greatest. It should not, the state of affairs should be that the desire to please Allah should be more than the desire to please the family. The desire to stop displeasing Allah should be more than the desire to stop displeasing the spouse or the children. The fear of the questions are the accountability of Allah should be more than the questions of the friends, of the peer pressure. This is Allah Zina Aminu Ashadduhu Balillah. And this is the first merit of belief. And for the second thing Prophet said, none of you will perfect your faith or belief until he, until he loves me the most. So after this, after Allah, the second preference or priority is the love for the Prophet Then Prophet in another words, he said, none of you shall complete his faith until his soul is obedient to what I have brought. So belief is what? It is loving Allah and his Prophet the most and out of love, obeying them totally and obeying them the most. And then the fourth are the words of the Prophet is that none of you is a believer if he does not like for his Muslim brother what he likes for himself. So for perfection of our belief and our faith, we need to opt, choose or prefer for our Muslim brothers whatever we want to for ourselves. We would not want to be mocked. We would not want to be humiliated, persecuted, made fun of. So we should not want this for our Muslim community also. Then Prophet said, none of you is a believer. If he goes to sleep with, if he goes to sleep with a full tummy and his neighbor stays hungry through the night, so caring and inquiring about the conditions of our neighborhood and helping them and supporting them will also be a cause of or a source of perfection of faith. And being ignorant or being hard-hearted about the conditions or status of the community around us will be source of failure of completion of our belief. Then, in other words, Prophet said, none of you is a believer till he leaves 
line completely even for humor. That even if in, for a state or a condition of humor, person is telling lies, then his belief is not perfected. And then in Bukhari, Prophet Sallallahu Abu Hurairah who reports that Prophet Sallallahu said about Islam, al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna bilisanihi wa yatihi. That a Muslim is one, a believer, a person having complete faith. A Muslim is one from whose hands and tongues a Muslim stays safe. And then Prophet Sallallahu said, al-Deenu nasiha, deen, religion, will be complete what? Ad-deen is what? It is all about sincerity. Sincerity to the fellow beings. Sincerity to the Muslim Ummah. So here we can compare and assess the level of our belief and our Iman. If you find your scoring is good, then what do you do? You say, Rabbana sabbit aqtamana. And you say, Ya muqallib al-qalubi sabbit qalbi ala deenik. And if you see that our scoring is not good, then say, Ya Musarrif al Qulubi, Surrif Qalbi ala Tu'atik. So, this is the first thing. The first characteristic and the trait of the Mutakin and the pious people is that they believe in the unseen. So, now the God fearing people are the people who are going to get guidance from Quran. Do they just need belief? Verbally, physically? Now, when they are physically going to believe, what they're going to do, the first thing is, salata. The first trait of the God-fearing people is, after belief and faith is, the first activity which is needed out of them is, the pious guided people, is that they, they relate with Salah. And what do they do with Salah? Do they offer Salah? No. Just highlight this in block letters today at the start of our session. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the maximum number of times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned about an order. The thing which is the most highly ordered in Quran is Salah. 700 times has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered in Quran about establishing of Salah. And wherever Wherever, in whichever surah, in whichever chapter, in whichever verse, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about salah? Nowhere does Allah say or talk or order about offering of salah. What his orders is establishing of salah. So we are not just expected to offer our salah. We are supposed and we are ordered and it is obligatory to establish establish salah so here today at the start the order and the words of akimu salata will be repeated 700 times in quran at the start of our session today i will be explaining what akimu salata actually means and it implements because the first thing it means is it is agreed upon by all all the scholars and in all the commentaries, the first thing which it means is offering con congregational salah by the Muslim men. Akibu salata means what? That Akibu salata means that it makes Muslim men, it makes, it, it makes them obligatory to offer congregational salah. So when people are going to ask you, that where in Quran is it mentioned that the Muslim men are supposed and it is obligatory for them to offer salah in congregation. So you will say, Akimu salata is the order which makes it obligatory for men to order their salah in congregation. And the second words are, Warqa we shall be discussing in two or three sessions, inshallah. So Akimu Salata, the words of Akimu Salata and the words of Warqa Uma are talking both. They mean and they imply that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered and made it obligatory for the Muslim men to offer salah in congregation, except for those who have some lawful excuse. And similarly, Prophet in a hadith explained and narrated in Bukhari 
It is a long hadith, so I will be explaining the <coughs> message. Prophet Sallallahu said, the narrator explained that the azan or the announcement or the proclamation of the salah had been called out and Akamat had also been called out and Prophet Sallallahu stood and he said that I thought of appointing somebody instead of me to lead the salah. And I myself thought of taking a flame and set fire to the houses where men after hearing the proclamation of Salah did not come, did not come to offer congregational Salah despite not having a due excuse. And in some narrations, the Prophet Salah also added the words that if I had not feared regarding the women, the children and the sick, then I would have done this. So this Akimu Salata means what? It is an order making men obligatory to offer salah. And then how, what is the excellence in Bukhari and Muslim? It is narrated that Prophet Sallallahu said that prayer in congregation is 27 grades better than praying alone. And then there was a person, it is um, reported in Muslim that there was a person, he was blind and he asked Prophet Sallallahu that is it obligatory for me? And Prophet Sallallahu said that, asked him that if he had heard the adhan, he said, yes, Prophet Sassam said, then you have to respond. I cannot find an excuse for you. And Prophet Sassam they said that any person who hears the call must respond and his prayer away from the mosque is invalid unless he has a good reason. And Ibn Masood says that in Medina, only the person who was a hypocrite would stay away from congregational salah. And Prophet Sassam has also explained that it the prayers who, uh, the people who found it difficult to offer the congregational salah were hypocrites. So this is the importance of congregational salah. And akimu salah means number one, what? Akimu salah means that it is actually offering salah by men in congregation. And then akimu salah. Now akimu salata beyond this also has another concept we need to understand. And uh, since this order has been made the maximum number of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this order about establishing salah. So uh, like in our initial and our starting sessions, I tend to explain the basic concepts and the fundamental concepts in a great detail. And then I will not be explaining about the concept of uh, Akimu Salata over and over again. Akimu Salata refers to a very extensive range of activities. And these activities would, number one, uh, start with the waiting and the planning of our Salah. That is uh, actually what means is that adjusting our timetable of our daily activities, like our sleeping and getting up and our meal timings or our, our um, get togethers, our recreations and all our daily activities according to the timings and the timetables of Salah. The second thing is to answer the proclamation or the call or adhan of Salah and then to recite the supplications and dua which have been taught to us by the Sunnah of the Prophet The third thing is to make a proper and a correct uh, preparation for Salah, like making a very proper wudu for purification according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, then a adopting and uh, taking up a proper dress as is mandatory and obligatory for the completion of salah may be for men as well as may be for women and then to select a clean quiet environment for the offering of salah and then after this after saying Allahu Akbar and after saying takbir when the salah starts this all was the establishing of Salah before the starting of Salah. Now, once the start, once we start with Salah, the establishing of Salah is number one, to establish or to offer the Salah according to the Sunnah of the Prophet That is the way he did his Qayyam, the way he placed his hands and the way he bowed down in the Raku and in the 
in the prostrations exactly to establish and to maintain and to follow the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi That is establishing of Salah. And establishing of Salah is to recite the Quran and the word and the du'as taught by the Prophet Sallallahu in the correct pronunciation. That also is a part of establishing Salah. And then a total self-control is what establishing of Salah is. That is, we have, we control our sight, our gaze, our ears, our hands, our feet, and the most, our thought process, the mind and the heart and the soul is where the, where the person is. <coughs> the condition of the state of affairs is not that. That the mind and the thought process is drifting away in the worldly thoughts and the worldly concerns. And we are just going on uttering and reciting the words of the Quran and the words of the Salah. No, this is not proper establishing of Salah. We are and our thoughts and our mind and our hearts and our all the things are where we actually are. Now, after saying salam and finishing off the salam, is salah established? No. You know what? The establishing of salah is easier before we start and while we are offering the salah. The difficult part of establishing salah starts after the completion of salah. And what is that? We keep up. We stay up. And we fulfill all the promises and pacts and covenants which we have made in Salah is establishing Salah. We say, we say, we promise, and then we sit. <coughs> we sit as very obedient ones, men, and we say, So this is all keeping up all these, fulfilling all these promises and covenants is what establishing Salah. And then coming up and maintaining and carrying on all the behaviors, the attitudes, the training which Salah has done is establishing Salah. Salah taught us humbleness. Salah teaches us punctuality. Salah teaches us purity. Salah teaches us cleanliness. Salah teaches us to actually bow down, obedience, towards Allah, surrendering uh, for Allah. And then Salah continuously is teaching us self-control. So this is all establishing of Salah. And another concept or another uh, portfolio of establishing Salah is that the dress code which we adopted during our Salah, we establish that. We carry on that dress code in the rest of our life. And it's not just that we adopt that dress during our five prayers and we could we just overlook it and we just give it away for the rest of the parts of the day. So this is all establishment of zakat, of salah. Now, is salah established? Still not. Still not established. How will it be established? That all the people who are under our influence, who are under our control, like our children, our servants, our slaves, our subordinates in the workplaces, who are under our influence and control, we try to ensure their offering of Salah as well. Because the person who is in control or in charge of all these people will be answerable for the Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, Wa'mur ahla bis ahlaka bis Salah. Order your people, order the family beings, your family members, order them to establish Salah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered in Quran, nara, that just don't turn selfish and try to save your bodies and your skin and muscles and all the parts of your bodies from the hellfire. Try to be equally God-fearing and try to save your family members and your loved ones from the hellfire also. So this is what establishing Salah is. Parents are answerable for all the children who are not yet adult about their salah. Remember a mother who offers the salah of the night, that is the Hajj salah, and then offers the Fajr salah, and then sits and offers the Ishraq salah. But she, in the whole process, seems not to be concerned about the salah of her 
adult children, I would label that she is being extremely selfish. She's just trying to prepare the key for her jana, and she is not just bothered about the key to jana for her children. What mothers generally have today, the trends of today are that we are bothered, the child stays up late till night preparing for the paper, preparing for the examination. The mother does not wake up the child for the Fajr Salah, saying that if the knee, if if the sleep is not, doesn't have a full night's sleep, then the, then the child will not be fresh for the paper. And we don't wake up the child for the Fajr Salah. How ironical and how foolish. We are worried about these exams these temporary short lived exams and we just forget about the day of the judgment, Maliki Yomid being the first question on the day of the judgment about Allah's rights are going to be about what? It is going to be about Salah. The results of which are going to be Holidina Fiha, Holidina Fiha Abana. We are not worried about that and we are worried about these worldly exams and these papers and these, these tests and trials. So this is establishment of Salah. And the next thing is They spent out of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for them. That is what the God-fearing people, the people who are going to be guided from Quran are that they pay their obligatory zakat. The order of salah and zakat together, akimu salata wa atu zakata together is mentioned 70 times in Quran. So now if here I repeat, two traits of people who will be guided from Quran and two traits of the pious God-fearing believers, they are what? In fact, three traits are that they believe and then they establish salah, they pay zakat, and also obviously they give supererogatory charity in the path of Allah. And the next verse Allah says, Allazina yukminuna bima unzila ilayka bama unzila min ablika. Then the God fearing people or the guided people are those, the next rate is that they believe in what has been revealed to you. You meaning what? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what was revealed before you, that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they do what? And of the hereafter, they are certain in faith. So these are the next behaviors and attitudes of people, the next need for guidance and the next need of uh, piety is to not just to believe in Prophet Sallallahu but also to have faith and have belief in the previous prophets and their books and their holy scriptures and to be sure and to have strong faith and belief on the day of judgment, it's happening, it's accountability, it's petitions, it's punishments, it's torments, it's rewards. So these are the traits of the God-fearing. About these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and sums up, muflihun. These will be the people upon the righteous guidance from their Lord. And it is those who will be what? They will be successful. Successful where? Both here and hereafter. Now, if I sum up, to get guidance from Quran, to be pious, to be God-fearing, to be successful here and hereafter, we need to do what? We need to have faith and we need to have strong and complete belief. The second thing is we need to establish salah. Just not offer salah, establish salah. The third thing is spend the path of Omar. And fourth is to believe in the prophets and the books all of them. And the final is to remember and plan and to be sure of the hereafter. So these are the people who will be guided, who will be God-fearing and who would be successful. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Now in the next verse, Allah says, Inna lazina kafar. Indeed, those who are what? Who disbelieve. Who are what? who are the kafirs, 
it is all the same for them. Whether you want them or you do not want them, they will not believe. So now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a condition, a status, which is totally opposite to belief, faith, and iman. That is disbelief. And that is kufr. The root word is kaf fa ra. And kafara means to refuse to accept or believe, to refute. I repeat, this is a state entirely opposite to belief and faith. Iman and kufr cannot coexist. If iman increases, then kufr decreases. And if kufr increases, then iman decreases. They are inversely proportional to each other. And what is kufr? And who is a kafir or who is a disbeliever? Now, is a disbeliever or a kafir a person who worships idols like the Makkans? Or is it the people who worship the stars and the moons and the sun and the fire or the trees? Yes, there is no doubt that the people of Mecca, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the fire worshippers, the idolaters, they're all kafirs. They're all kafirs, they're all disbelievers. But what we need to understand is that there's no doubt that they are the disbelievers. But what we need to relate and understand is that not only this is kufr, there is much, much more to kufr. And what is that? All those who do not believe, who do not accept what? Number one, who do not believe in the existence of a superpower, who do not believe in the creator of the universe. They say that there's no creator. There is no superpower. So these are the atheists and they are kafir and they are the disbelievers, number one. Then second, those who say that there is a superpower, a creator, but they do not believe in the existence of his books, his messengers, his prophets. They are also disbelievers and they are also kafirs. And this is also kufr. Third, those who accept the existence of Allah, the prophets and believers, but they refuse to connect, to read, to listen to the teachings of the prophets and the books. This is also kufr. And this is also disbelief. Then fourth, all those who believe in all these sources of divine guidance and also relate and connect with them and also learn from them. But then what do they do? They refuse to accept and believe the teachings to be righteous and truthful. They refuse to accept the messages of Quran to be righteous and to be correct. And the message of Sunnah and Hadith, they refuse to accept. So despite accepting the existence and the presence of Allah, Quran, and the prophets, and also connecting with them, but after connecting with them, they say that these teachings are not righteous, these teachings are not correct. They do not accept and believe in hearts of hearts after relating with them. This is also kufr. This is also disbelief. This is also refusing to accept. And the fifth form, of refusal of acceptance and kufr would be in a state when a person accepts Allah, the books of Allah, the prophets of Allah, reads them, connects with them, accepts them and believe what is said and ordered is correct, it is right, yes, it is true. But in the end of all this, despite in believing the righteousness of the message and teachings, he fails to accept in action, refuse to act upon them. Refuse to act upon the teachings of Quran and Sunnah is also a form of refusal, rejection. And this is also a form of kufr and disbelief. And remember, the more the commandments of Allah, a person after learning refuses to obey, the greater is the fraction of kufr. 
And the more he starts acting upon the teachings of Quran and Hadith, the color and the percentage of kufr goes on decreasing. About these disbelievers, Allah says, it is the same for them. Whether you want them or whether you don't want them, they will not be guided. And it is no use for them. Why is it of no use for them? Because next Allah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a stamp. Khatam Allah. Khatama means what? Khatama means a seal. It means a stamp. Allah has made a stamp on their hearts. And you know, when there is a stamp, then what happens is that when there's a seal or stamp, when something which is inside will not come out, and what is outside will not go in. So that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that there is a seal and a stamp on their hearts. And there is a cover and a shield on their eyes and on their ears. And that is why they just will not learn. They will not respond. They will not communicate and comprehend the teachings of Allah. And the result will be for them is a great punishment. So from here, we can also understand the reasons or the factors of disbelief or kufr. I shall be inshallah talking about them in detail, but here rather than elaborating on them, the reasons and causes of kufr and disbelief, number one is illiteracy, lack of knowledge. But for all the students of Quran and reciters of Quran and people who connected with sessions of Quran, obviously this no longer stays as a cause. So the first reason of kufr is illiteracy, lack of knowledge. And after gaining knowledge, the second cause is arrogance. To assume or to believe that my concepts, my behavior, my style is correct. It is better as compared to the message and teachings of Quran and Hadith or the, or the style or the customs or the norms or the laws and the rules and the regulations of my of my community, of my society, or my, my country, they happen to be na'uzubillah they seem to be better or correct as compared to the message and teachings of Quran. This is arrogance. And the third thing is obstinacy and stubbornness, which becomes a very main cause of kufr. The person becomes just obstinate and just stubborn down to the course and just stops and just does not accept the teachings. And the fourth cause is egoism. The person just becomes egoistic and makes it an issue or a case of his ego and becomes an ego problem that he just refuses to the teachings after understanding them. And the final cause of kufr and disbelief is the love of this world, the worldly riches, the reputation and the fame of this world, the success and the achievements of this world, the authority and the power and the post of this world and all these factors would lead, these will lead to the refusal to accept, believe or obey the teachings of Quran, Hadith, Allah and his prophet. So now we are going to summarize in today's session. When in Surah Fatiha, the person or the reciter of Quran glorified Allah, praised Allah, made a covenant with Allah, and then asked for what Ihdina Surat al Mustaqim specified about specifying about Surat al Mustaqim. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala handed over the book, Zalik al Kitabu, do what? La Rai, don't be doubtful about it. And you be what? You be pious and you be God fearing, then it will become a guidance for you. And here in the first chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained two categories. You know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has handed over the book. And handing over the book to the student of Quran and to the reciter of Quran in the beginning, in the initial few chapters, Allah is going to explain and relate that everybody who is going to take this book and who is going to connect with this book is not going to be the same. There are going to be four different categories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained the four categories of the students of Quran, of the reciters of Quran, of the people connected with Quran. 
explain these categories with their traits, with their behaviors, with their attitudes, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained that how will they end up with, what will their final result be. So in today's first chapter, the lesson of today and session of today, we've learned about the two categories, people who are the guided, people who are the pious, We've learned about their traits and the result will be that they will be that they will be successful. And the second category we learned about was the disbelievers, the inalazina kafaru, the people who are the kafirs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained their state of affairs and explained that they will be what? azabun alim. For them is a great punishment. In the next few sessions, we will be talking about the next two categories, that is the munafiqeen and the hypocrites, and the disobedience, that is the fasikeen. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Rabbana la tuzay qalubana bata is khadaytana wa khablana milladulka rahma innaka antul wakhaab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastakbiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil aizati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen. Summa ameen.